Hey, John here. Let's talk about finite state machines, okay? These things are what is at the essence of the synchronous counter we saw earlier. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at a kind of a finite state machine that's essentially a counter, all right? And then go from there. So what are these things? A finite, machine, a finite state machine a finite state machine is something that has a, a current state and it has a mechanism that calculates the next state. And every time a clock ticks, the next state updates the current state and we go on from there. That's why the counter is one of the simplest uh, finite state machines we can have, okay? Now we'll see there's two different ways of building them. One of them is called more and the other one is called mealy. For simplicity's sake, we'll stick to more, but we should know that there's two different kinds so that we can compare and contrast the pros and cons of each one and so that when you go poking around on the internet looking for more information, you're not confused when you're reading information about one kind or another uh, without understanding what those differences are and how it impacts your understanding. So first one, the more state machine. And as we will see, the way we differentiate between these two is how the overall connectivity between the circuitry is uh, uh, specified. Specifically, both types of state machines, all state machines, I should say, have basically a memory in them somewhere, a latch or a flip-flop, whatever you want to call it. That is I'll represent that in just one box here. This is the thing that holds on to the current state. When we have a counter, that's just simply the current count value, all right? You can have as many bits as you need in this latch to hold on to some binary number that enumerates through all the possible states that this machine could have. The current state can feed into some combinational circuitry just like we saw in our synchronous counter, that determines the value that the next state should be the next time our system clock ticks. This is this feedback loop in here. We don't need to talk about all the gates inside here anymore. We abstract that all away. So in, this, in the case of a simple synchronous counter, you just have these two sections here, and, the, and you're done, all right? But you can to add additional combinational circuitry over here to modify the output value as it propagates along. That's, you know, no big deal. In the synchronous counter, the state itself is the output. We clearly, we can, we can take any number of bits in our current state latches and run them through some gates and convert one number into another binary number if we wanted to, right? We don't need to really focus so much on what's inside here. The point is that the output of this more state machine is governed entirely by the current value of the latch that holds its state. It's like our, uh, our, our synchronous uh, counter. The count itself determines what the output would be. The count itself determines the next state as well in a synchronous counter. But we can also add, if we want, additional inputs over here. So let's look and see what we can do here. Let's create a synchronous counter, just like we did before, but we're going to add an extra input over here. That extra input is going to be an enable. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a counter that we can turn on and off. All right? So essentially what's going to happen is the clock will free run. We're never going to stop the clock. But we can tell the counter to stop counting. Don't worry about the clock. If we disable our counter, we're telling the counter to let the clock tick without advancing. That's the, that's the only change we're making to this design over that, which is just simply a synchronous counter that just free runs, okay? So what do we do? We have the current state. And we have our input. We have one more bit of input now. We determine the next state, and we show what the output is supposed to be. 
Uh, because we're just dealing with a counter, we can use the current state as it is without modifying it in any way to represent the output. So we can just uh, knock that one off right away. You can clearly see that Q1 and Q0 equal S1 and S0 in the case where we're just dealing with a simple counter. Okay, so let's focus then on this next state over here. The current state is 0, 0, and the counter is not enabled, then the next state will be 0, 0, and that makes sense. We're telling it don't count when the clock ticks because we've disabled it. If the current state is 0, 0, and the counter is enabled, the next state, should the clock tick, should become a 1. All right, so this is kind of like an on-off thingy. Go and tick along, advance your count on the next clock, or don't advance your clock. So I've had a nice catted up picture of this to put in that handout. I would, but I don't. So here is a, 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 tim a timing diagram, a waveform diagram, that shows what this synchronous counter with enable would do. All right. Let's say we have a free running clock. It just ticks along at some periodic rate without ever stopping. That's your given. Okay. Here's our enable input down here. It goes up and down over the course of time. This is yesterday over here and tomorrow is over there, right? So if the clock is ticking and the current state is given by Q and Q, uh, Q0 and Q1 here, you know, what, what should happen, right? Well, if the enable is high and we have a, 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 a falling edge, this is obviously, if I draw the cause effect lines on here, right? sensitive to the falling edge of this clock. You can clearly see that the output Q values only change on these falling edges here. I probably should have included these to make that perfectly clear, or otherwise drew you a schematic showing you a latch with a bubble on it. Okay, so anyway, if the enable is high, when the clock falls, and the current state is zero, zero, then the next state should be zero, one. Later on, if the clock falls and the enable is true and the current state is zero, one, the next state becomes one, zero. Okay? The clock falls and enable is off. It's down, it's low, it's zero, call it what you want we are effectively disabling our counter. In other words, don't advance right now. So the clock falls, the enable is low, the current state does not change. It doesn't advance the counter. Enable can come high again later on. Falling edge on the clock. Then the state is updated to the current state plus one, right? One zero plus one is one one because remember this is still a counter. The next state oh, in this scenario, when the enables high, should reflect the transition between a two and a three, and so on. If the current state is a three, and we have an enable, and there's a falling edge on the clock at that time. The next state becomes a zero. Okay, this is what we're talking about here: a counter with an enable. Let's jump around a little bit to understand what it means to recognize a message before we design a circuit that does it, all right? Let's get all on the same base here. What does it mean to recognize a 0, 1, 1, all right? The implication here is that, you know, in this, in this design, we have a single input whose value is D. We have a single output whose value is Q. Q will become true, which it does right here. At the point in time when the state machine recognizes that D has delivered a message whose value is 0, 1, 1. The way you uh, interpret the 0, 1, and 1 is that you get a 0 when the clock ticks, followed by a 1 when the clock ticks after that 0. The next clock tick must be a 1. The clock tick after that must be a 1 in order to recognize this message. So let's look and see what's going on in this diagram. Let's ignore the state numbers for a minute. We'll come back to that later. Here's your clock ticking. We're going to advance on the falling edge of the clock. All right? 
No need to become inconsistent there. What happens here? On the falling edge of the clock, we look at the value D and we see a zero. Well, we ask ourselves, have we accumulated? Do we recognize a zero one one yet? No, we have. We do not, because all we've seen so far is a zero. That zero might be part of a message that is zero one one, but we haven't seen the whole thing yet. The clock ticks. We saw a zero. That's all we know so far. Clock ticks again. What do we see now? A zero. Well, was that a zero one one? No, that was a zero zero. All right, so we haven't seen it yet. Clock ticks again. We now see a one. You say, aha. We might have a zero one if you know we have another one after that, then then we do then we can say we've recognized it, but we haven't seen the whole thing yet. We've only seen some zeros followed by a zero and a one. What happened before this zero and one is totally irrelevant. We've seen a zero and we've seen a one, and we're hoping that we're gonna see another one here, okay? And that we do. And the next time the clock ticks over here at time index eight, we see another one. So what have we seen? We've seen something, 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 followed by zero, one, one on these clock ticks. This circuit then asserts Q as true to say, hey, I just saw a zero, one, one on this D input over the course of time. And that time is defined by this clock, this master clock. Everything is tied back to this master clock. These two ones exist solely because the system observed a one at these two clock ticks here after it observed a zero on this clock tick there. Just because it goes from zero to a one doesn't mean that it'll always ultimately see two of them. It has to stay there long enough for that to be true, okay? So the output goes high for one clock period after it saw this message, and then it goes back low again. Now, what would happen down here, right? It would go uh, along its merry way and try and recognize another message. When the clock ticks here, it sees a zero. It could be that that is the zero of another message. And it would be if there were two ones over here. All right? So the system remembers it saw a zero right there. Clock ticks again, it sees another zero, and it says, well... Uh, I saw two zeros in a row, so that's not the message, but I still have a zero. So maybe this zero is the beginning of the next message I want to recognize. This is all right, fine. Clock ticks again. It gets a zero. Same thing happens, right? Well, uh, clearly these two zeros over here are not part of the, what could be this message, but this one might be. So it waits for another clock to tick and so on. Eventually, it could run into another situation like this over here. Okay, where all of a sudden it gets two ones and, it, and then Q would become true again. So that's what it means to recognize a message, right? These values over the course of time as defined by the edges of the clock that, that, uh, that trigger our state machine to advance, okay? So now that we know what a me message recognizer is, we can define our, our uh, state table. We can define some states. We can define our output Q. This time Q is not just going to be the value of the state. All right? Q goes 1 if over the recent history, D was a 0 followed by a 1 followed by a 1. Now, that's kind of hard to see in this diagram. This diagram here, when I draw these things up, I always do them after I've moved on to draw my state diagram. These are easier to draw up. Let's see what's going on here. We say when you turn on the system, you have no state. Therefore, just start here. State number zero. Output is zero. Have I recognized a message whose value is zero, one, one? No, I have not. All right. What happens if my input is a one at that time. Well, by definition, I have not yet seen a zero. So let's just sit here, okay? Till I see a zero. All the while saying, no, I have not seen what I'm looking for. Eventually, if I see a zero coming in my input, I can say, aha, 
Let's change my state. The state in itself represents what I have recognized so far. This is the, I saw one zero, and I need another pair of ones before I can say I've seen my whole message. But if I see a zero, I know I might be on my way. That's what's going on here. So the state changes from zero to a one. I have not yet seen a zero one one in a message form, so my output is a zero. Now let's say I see a bunch more zeros, okay? And this was the case over here. Notice the state here, zero, one, one. Now you can start to see what this is all about. I'll explain the notation in a minute. State zero, state one. This timing diagram up here, the clock ticked twice. It went from state zero to state one. Then it went from state one to state and state one. Why? Because it saw these two zeros right here. That's exactly what's going on here. I mean, um, I start up, I'm in state zero, I saw a zero, I move over to state one. I see another zero, I stay in state one. All the while, I'm outputting a zero on my queue, all right? Now let's talk about this notation up here. Because, you know, everyone knows what timing diagrams, what waveforms look like, right? Do I really need to show every signal of every bit of the state register, the latch that holds the state? No, I don't. Quite often you end up with a state that's got, you know, 32, 64 bits wide in it. And it becomes totally un un unmanageable. So what we do is we say, look, the collection of all the possible state bits, the state bus, right, the collection of related signals, I'm going to show it like this. And what this means is the state rep is represented by more than one bit. Those bits may or may not all be the same. It turns out they are in this particular uh, time for, in this time window here. But we draw it like a box like this and say, look, during this period of time, the, all the bits collectively represent this binary number, zero, zero. At this time, on this falling edge, the state may change to something else. That's what this little X over here is. And then it'll stay a constant during this time window here. And that's because the state can only change on these falling edges. So during this time here, the state is one. Clock ticks. It can change. It turns out it didn't. But between the, this time window over here, the state is 1. Clock ticks. The state now moved to 2. Clock ticks here. It was 2 over here. It is now 3 over here. All right? That's how you read this thing. This is just many lines all abstracted together, and then we just put in the box the values of all the different bits. Okay? Makes it easier to read. And easier to draw. All right, so let's go back to this state uh, diagram down here. You can actually see in the state diagram, I purposely drew it this way, and this is how I draw them for myself. If I need to recognize something, what I'll do is I'll line them up across the page like this. You can see the zero and the one and the one right here. This is for me anyway to keep my to keep them readable by myself. I try as best I can to organize them like this. And in my mind, I'm, this is the state machine that's going to recognize this 0, 1, 1 series of bits as the clock ticks. And you can even see over here, the state over there, that's when the output is a 1. So what's going on? I fire up. I wait for the first 0 to arrive. I stay in here if the state's 1 because by definition it could never become a recognized message until I see a 0. The zero is the first bit I need to see before I see those other two ones. I have a single bit input, therefore I have two possible values. I have two transition arrows leaving this state to cover all possibilities. When I'm in this state over here, I can get as many zeros as I want, and I'm still okay. This state to me means I saw at least one zero so far. If I see a one... After I saw a zero, at that point, I'm like, aha, I've seen a zero one. If I see another one after this on the next clock tick, I would then transition over here and say, aha, I saw it. I saw a zero and a one and a one. So there's my output 
of Q is a 1. Now notice that this, the, both transitions that leave this state for the 0 and the 1 end up going to other states. All these other states have zeros for the outputs. Okay, so that I can only stay in this state for one clock tick. There's no loop around in here. Same thing is true about this one over here. These two states, if I ever end up in this state, the next clock tick will transition to some other state simply because there's none of these uh, loops in here. All right, these states I can stay in there for a long time. Once I go over here, I'm committing myself. Either I've seen it or I haven't, is what happens. Once I've seen it, I am either starting to see a new one or I've got garbage and I've, I've got to start all over again. Okay? So let's look at these other arrows. Clearly, the, 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 the obvious case is I've started up, I see a zero, then I see a one, then I see a one, and there's my output. And this is why I line them up like this. Take care of the obvious case. Well, then what do you do? Well, if I never see a zero to begin with, wait for my first zero. That's how I figure that one out. Once I've seen a zero, I can get more zeros. That's okay, and I can stay here. Once I see this one, if I then see a zero after that, I'm going to come back here because... Clearly, this, this, so this zero and a one that I've seen so far cannot be, by definition, ultimately become a zero, one, one, because I've just seen a zero and a one and a zero. Well, what if this zero is the first bit of this message that's yet to come? That's why I go to this state here. This state represents I've seen one zero so far, maybe more. Doesn't matter. I've seen one. If the next bit after that is a 1, I come back over here again. Why? Because I saw a 0 and a 1. If I see a 1 at that point, I've seen the 0, 1, 1, and everybody's happy. Okay? Let's assume we've seen the 0, 1, 1, and then the clock ticks one more time. Well, if I see a 1 at that point, that 1 there cannot be part of a message that I will recognize. So I have to come way back over here and wait till I see another zero again to start this process of advancing towards my goal all over again. All right? So in order to see a zero, one, one, I ultimately need to hop through these three states. One way or another, I can see a zero. After recognizing a message, I can see a zero in the middle of what might have been a message. And it doesn't matter. Either one of those zeros followed by even more zeros, can start me on my way to recognizing the 011 sequence again, all right? So you have to account for every possibility is the, is the takeaway here, and you have to organize it so you don't miss something. You know, if you naively said, oh, I saw it, and you come way back over here when you got a zero, you would have effectively ignored that zero. And it would then require a zero followed by another zero to get yourself back on to recognizing a message. Very common mistake to make. Okay? Once you've recognized a message, you're still consuming data. The clock is ticking. you got to deal with the fact that you might see the next message right away. Or not. Okay? So once, so once you've got this all worked out, you go back in, you know, and you number all your states and you and you figure out your outputs. Once you've got these state numbers down, you can come back up here and you can work out your state table like this as needed. Uh, these are merely the numbers you just saw in the diagram. The D is your input, as you know. The next state, obviously, is what the, what the state number is of the next state you want to go to when D is a 0. The next state you want to go to if D is a 1. And you can see in here... Uh, if the current state is 0, 0, and I get a 1, that's your loop back to stay in state 0. If the current state is a 0, 0, and I've got a 0, the next state is a 1. All right, so that's those two rows in the table describe this guy right here. Current state's a 0, and I got a 1, stay here. Current state's a 0, I got a 0, go over to here. Okay, so there's the link between the state diagram and this state table up here. Q, I think, is self-explanatory. Uh, if you're in state 1, 1, Q is 1. 
because when you're state 1-1, that's the far right state in that four-state diagram I just drew you. That is when we had recognized the full message, okay? And all the other ones, you, you can work that out yourself. And again, if you want to, you can define N1 and N0 by using the uh, sum of products. Clearly see there's three situations when N1 becomes 1. Therefore, there's three terms that are sum of products. There's four states or four conditions when N0 has to be 1. Therefore, you're going to see four uh, uh, products in here. Q1 is true if and only if state 1 and state 0 are both 1s. Okay? Now... Let's look back at this thingy in here. I wish I could get a bigger screen here. Let me shrink this down a little bit. I don't know how visible this will be. Certainly if you watch this on your phone or something, uh, it's kind of small, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the short of it is, these numbers here match the state numbers in, these, in the state diagram I'm over here, okay? So when I'm in state zero, which is this guy here, I have a zero state in my in my uh, timing diagram, my waveform diagram over here, okay? And when I'm in this state and I see a zero, according to this diagram down here, I transition from state zero to state one. And you can see up here, I got state zero there, and I got state one here because I saw a zero on the D. And because both of these say I'm supposed to be outputting zeros, you can see Q is zero in both of these states, all right? During both of these time periods. This timing diagram here shows more of the possible transitions. In fact, I went out of my way to, to, to draw all of them, okay? Uh, and that is what happens if you've got Ds oscillating high and low and so on. And here's the state numbers and so on. And I don't see a full message. What happens? If I see a 0 followed by a 1 followed by a 0, what should happen? Well, according to this... If I see a zero, after starting, I should go over here. And if I see a one, I end up over here. And then I see a zero, I should end up back in state one. I should see a zero, one, two, one. Zero, one, two, one. That's exactly what happens over the course of time. So this shows me the history of time that actually took place. This shows me really more about the future. It talks about the past and the future all at the same time. If I'm in state 1, 0 over here, state 2, what do I know has happened in my history? I know that at least there was a 0 and a 1 received on my input, whether I went from here, going from 0 to a 1, or if I was over here and saw a 0 and a 1 this way, or I already saw a message and I saw a 0 and a 1, no matter what, I've seen, by definition, a 0 and a 1 in the last two clock ticks. That's what being in this state means, okay? So, if we look... Oops, I'm sorry. If we look at all the possible transitions down here, what I've done is I've said, well, what happens if D only goes high for one clock tick and then back down? Make sure that this design works and makes sense that I end up where I'm supposed to be. That's why I drew this up like this to say, did I go into state 0, 1, 2, 1? Yes. If D stays low in that situation, do I stay in state 1? Well, the answer should be yes, right? Because I'm in this state right here. 1, if I'm seeing zeros, I stay there. Okay, tick, 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 tick. And that's what's happening here. If I see a 1, I go back to state 2 again. Why? Because that's the first 1 that might be a message. So I go into state 2. I'm in state two now. I see another zero. Dag nabbit, not the one I'm looking for. So I'm over here and I see a zero. I come back over here to state one. All right, and that's what, exactly what happened here. I went over to state two. I saw uh, uh, another zero. It's not the message you're looking for. I go back to state one. Now I see a one on the data in. So I go to state two. I see another one, I go into state three. And while I'm in state three, I know by definition I have seen a zero and a one and a one in that order with no gaps. And in this state, I assert Q to be true to let the world know I just saw my message. Now, while Q is high and I'm in the, yay, I'm all happy now state because I saw what I'm looking for, I have to still count for 
what happens the next time the clock ticks. So look what's happening here. The clock ticks again, and I see a zero. I transition into state one. I was over here. I saw a zero. I transitioned into state one. Okay. So there's my zero. I transition into state one. I see an, a one on the next clock tick, so I transition into state two. There's my state two. So I went from uh, recognizing it. I saw a zero. I then saw a one. I'm back over here in state two, right? I then see another one. I go back into state three because I just saw a zero, one, one. When I'm going to say three, I assert Q to let the world know I saw my message. After I'm in state three, if I see another one, I need to go back into state zero. That's what's happening here. Because I saw one right there. Okay, again, here's the diagram. Shows me going back to state zero from three if I did not see a zero. All right, I see another one. While I'm in state zero, that's this loop right there. Okay, I then see a zero, and I might be on my way to seeing a new message, so I move to state one, and so on. That's how to read these things, okay? All right, as fun and fine and dandy as all the theory is, what if we want to build a circuit to actually do this job? What do we do? How do we draw the schematic of this thing, all right? Well, we know that it's a state machine and the state is stored in a latch. So let's start by drawing our latch, okay? I'm gonna use a D latch that has a falling edge clock. The clock and the input to the circuit, the D, uh, come from other circuitry. It comes from outside the domain of our solution. So we don't have to worry about that. It has what? The state is represented by a two-bit number. Therefore, we have Q0 and Q1. So this is a two-bit D latch then. If it's a D latch, it'll have a D0 and a D1 like this. Now we know that D0 and D1 in our state table, I called them N0 and N1. So I'm going to label these signals outside of this latch here, okay? And we know that we can calculate the value of N0 using the value of the current state, as well as the D input that I haven't drawn over here yet. And we can express the value of N0 using the sum of products of those three input bits, all right? So the easiest way I know to draw a schematic with that in it is you, you just put a decoder over here, all right? Why? Because a decoder calculates. A decoder is the thing that can calculate the product of every possible combinations of all of its inputs. And what are the inputs of this decoder? Well, one of them is the D input. To match our, um, our state table, let's hook up the D input to the A. Okay, what are we going to use for these other ones? I'm going to use a three input decoder. Because... We need to deal with D. We need to deal with these two bits of the state. Okay, so what have we got here? In order for this to work out right, we want to run Q0. Around to uh, B. And I'm doing this, but you can do this in any order, really. But in order to make this understandable and match, as you will see, our state table, this is the way you want to do this. Now, we got three inputs. How many outputs do you have in a decoder? Two to the third power. And therefore, you got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are all the possible products given these three inputs. Now, we express N0 and N1 by using sum of products. Well, how do you sum? Well, you use... Use a nice OR gate. I'm going to run a nice big OR gate right here for N0. So N0 is true when these three bits are 0. When I got a 010 and a 101 over here and a 110. Well, if I look at all three of these columns as a single binary number, that's 0 and a 2 and a 5 and this one's 6. And one, obviously, the same way would be three, four, and five. So that has to be true when our, our products are zero, two, five, 
and six and try to be somewhat neat not to get too, too many lines crossing in here and one is true another big old or gate over here when and this is equal to either three or four or five okay it gets a little messy in here but keep your lines relatively on right angles like this otherwise they're hard to see don't put squiggles everywhere it makes it really hard to read yes this isn't beautiful but you know it can be much worse this is the uh circuit to calculate the next state giving the current state and the current input how do we then calculate our output well we know that the output over here which we marked q in our official design is when q0 and q1 are both high in state number three so we can just simply tap these off and say if they're both high put an and gate right in here and say done q is true if i'm in state number three whatever state i'm in and the current input dictates what the next possible state would be notice that the one here and the seven down here are not used at all and that makes perfect sense because in the row number one and seven of our state table both n0 and n1 are supposed to be zero in that time so this is a quick, you know, sanity check. These better not be connected to anything in here. Because in these two situations, this better be zero. So there's a schematic for the message recognizer of a 011, expressed as a more state machine. So I'm sure at this point you're saying more, more, more. Yeah, well, yeah, well, well, that's all there is to the more state machines. But wait, there's Mealy state machine so what's the difference here right well the mealy state machine the output doesn't come solely from the latch in the state machine it can come from the latch and or the input the current input signals so we draw it up like this we can create a combinational circuit that creates the new state based on the current state and the inputs that's the same as the the more style state machine however the output can be made just off the latch alone if we want to or we can also include the current inputs that is given by the fact that this box here is in the flow of this arrow now as we can see there's two things that happen in a mealy state machine. This simplified picture, much like a ripple counter, all right? It can simplify the circuit design here. And at times, you can even create a state machine that even requires fewer states to get the same job done. However, like our ripple counter, there are some potential downsides to this kind of a design. So you have to be careful when we apply this now let's look at the same exact message recognizer well they're going to recognize a message that goes from zero to one to one notice this new state table has less states in it this will be simpler let's look at our state machine diagram first let's make sure we know the differences here look at this thing it's a little different than the more state diagram you know, we're recognizing the same exact message this is a mealy state diagram as suggested the state alone does not indicate the current output it is the state in combination with the current input that determines the output so if I'm in state zero and the D input is a one, I should be outputting a zero. If I'm in state zero and the D input is a zero, I should be outputting a zero. All right. Now in this particular state machine, this is a fairly simple one, but you do see a difference over here. When I'm in state two over here, and the input is a zero, I output a zero. 
But if I'm in state two and the input is a one, I output a one. Now let's walk through this from the beginning. Start here, just like before, no difference. Every state with one binary input has two possible transitions that it could make depending on those inputs. If I'm in state zero and the input's a one, stay in state zero. And when it's a one, output is zero. If I'm in state zero and the input's a zero, output is zero, and go over to state one. Again, these transitions occur when the clock ticks. So what do we got here? If I'm in state zero and I see a zero, I go over to state one. If I see another zero, I stay here. This part of it's the same as the one we just saw. The more state machine has the same kind of starting up. Yeah, yeah, throw away any extra zeros and remember that I saw one of those zeros, right? The most recent clock tick saw a zero. That's what this state means. If I'm getting more zeros, that's fine. I, logically, I'm throwing away the old ones and saying, yeah, I'm still good. I got a zero. That could be the first zero of a message I want to recognize. If I've seen a zero and all of a sudden I start seeing a one, I say, aha, the next state should be two and output a zero because I haven't yet seen the whole message yet. What have I seen so far? I've seen a zero and I've seen a one. Well, if I'm in state two and I see a one, I know I'm about to see that whole message. Therefore, I can start outputting this one right away. And that's the big one of the big difference. There's one of the two main differences between Mealy and Moore. In a Mealy state machine, the output that says, I've seen a message in the Moore design is a little different. The output is, I am seeing a message. As we'll see when we look at the waveform diagram, this Mealy machine allows the system to recognize that it has seen a message one clock tick sooner than we do with a more state machine. Okay, so in theory, this can be faster. Obviously, in this case, it is faster. It will be faster. All right, so I've seen a zero, and I've seen a one, and I've seen a one. Look what happens in this case. If I've seen that second one, I go back into the state over here because in this situation, I've just seen a one. I need to see a zero before I can start working my way back over here and say, okay, I've seen the message. All right. That's why we throw this extra state away because I can recognize this one tick earlier. I don't need that extra state that says I have seen it and then sit in a state for an entire clock tick so that I can report that I've seen it in the more style design. This one, it says, I got a zero, I got a one. If I'm getting another one, I can output right away and say, I've seen it. I will have seen it on the next clock tick and just go on my merry way. If I get a zero followed by a one and then I get another zero, well, then I have not seen a zero one one, but I just saw a zero, so I'll put a zero. And go back to the state over here because this state represents I've seen one zero. And now I'm looking for a one to make up my message. Okay. See what's going on here? All right. So the two big takeaways are you can have less states in a in a melee design. And the outputs determined not by the state, but by the state and the current input. That's why the diagram looks like this. Here's the current state. And the current input can all come together into some arbitrary combinational circuit to determine the current output. So if I'm in state zero and I see a zero input, I want to output a zero and I want to go to state one. All right, so let's look and see what's going on up here. State zero, and I got an input of zero. My next state should be a one, okay? And the output should be zero. If I'm in state, what, zero, and my input's a one, I need to output a zero, and I need to stay in state zero. Okay? So here's state zero with an input of one. I stay in state zero. 
and I output a zero. Perfect. So far, so good. If I'm in state one and I see a zero, I'll put a zero and stay in state one. Okay, state one, I see a zero, output a zero, stay in state one. So far, so good. State one with an input of one, output a zero and transition to state number two. State one, input one, transition to state two, output a zero. Okay, state two, uh, and I see a zero, I go back to state one. State two, and I see a one, I go back to state zero. Okay, state two with a zero, go back to one. State one, two with a one, I go back to state zero. All right, so that's these two. And my outputs are here and here. So if I'm in state, uh, what is that, two with a zero, here's state two with a zero, I need to output a zero, so that matches this. If I'm in state two and I get a one, that's when I've seen my message, I want to output a one, that's this guy down here. Now, there's a little less to do here. Notice that N1 only has one time, one case when it's high. So my sum of products is a little easier. There's only one term in here, one, one product. What about this guy here? One, two, three, there's only three. Last time I had four. So clearly, there's less gates involved in this thing. Now, my Q is a little more complicated. Q is S1 ended with S0 bar ended with D because this is 101. It has to match this situation over here. Okay? But as we'll see, since this combinational circuit is used to calculate the next um, state and the output, if we play our game with our decoder over here, we can use the decoder to do everything. All right, and then we just need a decoder and some OR gates, and we'll be done. Here's a state, uh, uh, or rather, a, a, a timing diagrams for the Mealy machine. This one shows all possible ta uh, transitions like we saw before on the more state machine. And uh, what happens in here is that the Q, let's zoom in as much as we can here. There's a couple of these. This is all, all possible situations. So you got a state that's zero, state one, state two, one, one, two, and so on. Look what's happening here with the Q. Look at how everything's a little bit shorter and faster together. All right. So if we go back up here, I wish I could get all this on the same screen at the same time. Sorry about that. What do we got? We got a zero and a one and a two. So when we recognize our message, we should see uh, us transitioning from state zero to state one to state two, and then back to state zero again. So we got a zero, one, two, and we end up going back to state one. What's going on with that? We went from zero, one, two, back to one. So in this scenario, we did not recognize our message. Okay, now let's look and see what's going on down here. Look, the Q actually went on down there. Is that right? Yes, it is. This is one of the downsides of the Mealy machine. These things can glitch and generate, uh, you know, all kinds of noise on its output. Notice we went from 0, 1, 2, back to 1 again. Why? Because we saw a 0 on our data line. And we saw a 1. And because D is still high, Mealy thinks, well, if D stays high and the clock ticks again, Q should be high. So it starts outputting Q prematurely. But before we get to this clock tick, D goes back down again. And the clock ticks and it sees a zero. Well, when D goes down, it says, oh, whoa, 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 hold on there. Q is not supposed to be high, so it puts it back down again. So that when the clock ticks here, Q stays honest and reports that it has not seen a message yet. So one, one takeaway from this is you can only consider the value of Q when the clock ticks. You cannot consider it at a, any old time you want. You have to look at it when the clock ticks. Now, you might be saying, well, what about over here? Well, Remember that Q changes as a result of the state number, the propagation delay through the latch 
and the circuitry that calculates the value of Q causes this to be a propagation delay later than that clock ticking. So if you are monitoring Q when this clock ticks, if I could zoom in super far, what we would see is that Q goes high just after this state changes. So when the clock ticks here, Q is low. Okay, now it glitches, it goes up, it does like a head fake, comes back down again before the clock ticks again. This is a hallmark of a melee state machine. All right, it can give you head fakes every now and then. So you only look at Q when the clock edge is present. So what do we got here? We got a zero on D. We got another zero on D. We would expect it to stay in whatever state is the I'm getting zeros and getting ready to see a new message now state, which is one, right? That's the state right here. It has seen a zero, 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 waiting for a one, okay? That's state one. And the output, whether he gets a zero or a one, still stays at, at, at zero. So that's why Q stays zero down here. It's seen a zero, seen a zero, and so on. Finally, it sees a one again, just like over here, and it says, aha, if the D stays high, my Q should be high on the next clock. But it goes down again, and it says, oh, head fake again, takes it away, goes back to state one, and says, okay, I'm now reset in, in, in my state machine to saying I just saw a zero, and I need to get two ones before I can clock out a Q. Well, that's what's happening over here. So it just saw a zero. It then sees a one, and it says, okay, it stays one in here, so get ready. Make Q high here so that if a clock ticks again while the D input is still high, I have seen a message. And, and like I said, Q changes in response to the current state number. So when this clock ticks right here, Q is high right after that clock ticks, or the edge falls, we say, then Q goes low. So at this point right here, we've seen our message. Okay? The very next clock tick later, it sees a zero, it then sees a one again, it gets ready and it asserts Q, it says as long as the data stays high, when the next clock tick comes, the Q should be high at that time, and it is. When we clock out, we've seen two messages. Now, unlike the more machine, this recognize these two messages in less time because we don't have to say, I saw a zero, I saw a one, I saw a one, and then report that it saw it. Right? Again, I can't stress enough. Mealy can say, I saw a zero, I saw a one, I'm seeing another one, and if it stays there long enough, I will have seen a message, and it reports it one clock tick sooner. So if you can express yourself using a Mealy machine, you can write faster, uh, write faster code. <laughs> you can build faster hardware, is what I meant to say there. But the downside of this is all these other glitches coming along in here. So either you have to control the input data to prevent these glitches, Glitches, or you have to build the circuitry that reads the output of this such that these glitches on Q do not cause a problem. Okay? Now, let's look and see what happens when they get really nasty, right? Well, what if Q is bouncing up and down? Right? Look at what's seen down here. If Q is going up and down and up and down and up and down, because Q is given as a function of not just the current state, but also the current inputs. I mean, we've already seen it up here. The input changes can cause Q to change right away. We could say asynchronously with the clock. In the Mealy machine, the output Q can change any old time. It can change when the clock ticks. It can change when the input's going on and off. All right? Again, we got to be very careful. All right? Look what happened here when it actually recognized a message. It sees a zero. It sees a one. And it says, okay, if it stays high, I want to make sure that I've reported that, I, that I'm seeing it. But it goes low, so it takes it away. It says, uh-oh, it's not high anymore. Goes high again. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, no, it isn't. Oh, yes, it is. 
It's high on this clock tick over here. Therefore, it reports it has seen a 0, a 1, and a 1. This is not wrong, okay? Because by definition, as I said earlier, what does it mean to recognize this message? It means that you saw a 0 on the clock edge, a 1 on the next clock edge, and then a 1 on that third clock edge. That recognizes that message. <laughs> it's perfectly okay that this happens. It's also perfectly okay in a, in a Moore-style machine because of the definition of what it means to see this message, okay? However, in a Mealy machine, this starts spewing like crazy. In a Moore machine, that would never happen. Why? Because it doesn't report that it has seen a message until way over here. Any glitches that take place would have taken place in the past, and the queue would not have glitched during those cases, because in a more machine, the queue is solely uh, uh, expressed in terms of the current state number. And the state can't glitch, because the state is only updated on the falling edge of a clock. All right? So what is the takeaway in here? All state machines must contain latches to hold their current state. Combinational circuits are used to determine the next state. If you're using some products, you can play the game like I showed you with that decoder. In some cases, a mealy machine can have fewer states than the equivalent more machine. We've just seen that. We have one less state. We have fewer terms in our sum of products. I shouldn't have to go back and redraw another decoder circuit with some OR gates to show you how to build this. You build it exactly the same way. But you can tap Q by using the decoder. This is number five from a three input decoder. Other than that, this is the same thing as the Moore machine. I'll leave that as a task for the viewer to work that out. So what do we got? More machine outputs are driven from the latch only. All right, that's what I just said. Uh, more machines up uh, change synchronously with the clock edge. Mealy machines are driven from the latch signals and the input signals. Therefore, they can change either when the clock ticks or the input signals change. All right. So there's your takeaway, your observations of what the differences are between these two machines. Thanks for watching. See you next time.